Um, yeah, welcome to my talk on large-scale Bayesian inference for estimation of retail article rates. Um, that is about a large-scale machine learning application for Zalando operations. And that was joint work with my colleagues Urs Bergmann and Kelvin Stewart. Starting point of our work was the question, well, what is actually the weight of all the individual articles we have in Zalando's warehouses? Um, that is interesting and important for a number of logistics and operations processes. And surprisingly, this information is not, supplied, uh, is, is not provided by the suppliers of the article in great generality. So most of our articles we, we, we sell, we don't know what, what they weigh. And um, that gave rise to people from the operations team to set up a manually weighing process. So they acquired a number of those scales on wheels, if you want. And they also have, sorry, they also have a volume scanner included and an electric scale. But then it turned out that this process is rather tedious. You know, we have like hundreds of uh, picking aisles in the warehouses like this, and they, we have um, uh, we have a chaotic storage strategy in the warehouse. And you can imagine it is quite tedious to move with that with that scale trolley through the warehouse, find your, find your articles you want to weigh next. Um, and it, quite, uh, it required quite a lot of work. But moreover, it turned out that this process is rather inaccurate. And we can easily check that when we look at the histogram of the density, which you compute by the volume over the white, and make a histogram of the density of our articles, and we see that good part of our articles would be heavier than water, even heavier than solid steel. And on the other hand, uh, quite a number of articles would be lighter than an empty shoebox or an empty parcel box, which is quite weird. And these outliers are certainly pro errors in, in the manual measurement process. And that was a point where we, where we thought, well, can we, can't we improve that process with some machine learning? And Interestingly and luckily, in the outbound process in, in the warehouse, all parcels go through such a large maze of conveyor belts. And at some point on this conveyor um, tour, there's an automatic high precision scale and volume scanner. So we know virtually the, we know the weight of all, our uh, of all our parcels we ship out, and we know their volumes. Well, so the question is, well, when we know the weight of the, of the parcel and we know what has been in there, couldn't we deduce the weight of the articles from, from just the parcel weights? And that's exactly what we try to approach. Well, at first glance, this looks like a set of linear equations. So we have, we have um, our articles as unknowns. There are n articles in this example. And we have m equations, one for every parcel that had been shipped out. Well, looks actually quite OK. Moreover, the coefficients of this set of equations are sparse, since most parcels contain only one or a few items, not all of them. Pretty nice, a sparse linear set of equations. But then it turned out that some nasty things happened there, namely, we have more unknowns, and that is uh, the, the tear weight of the parcels themselves and all the stuffing material and vouchers and whatever is in the parcels. This gives rise to additional m unknown variables. Well, not too, not too good. And even worse, it turned out that the individual articles themselves, although they are of the same kind and same size, may fluctuate in weight considerably. This is mainly due to different, different packaging materials the suppliers used occasionally. And, well, this actually completely destroys the, the idea of the set of, of linear equations. But then all these variables are not completely independent. So they, they, 
they of course share some very strong um, statistical properties and we made use of them to still solve this problem. And our approach is a large-scale Bayesian graphical model, which I describe later. We made some requirements for the weight estimation. At first, we want to have a distribution estimate for the articles of an SKU. An SKU is a stop-keeping unit, and that identifies a particular article in a particular size. And since they can fluctuate, we want to have distribution estimates there. Then, in the whole model, we, we want to have more or less realistic distribution assumptions, but still, we want to be able to solve this problem. I um, think we found a good trade-off. And, of course, it must be scalable. So, it must scale to in the order of millions different SKUs, in the order of tens of millions send out parcels, and in the order of hundreds of millions individual items that were shipped out. And of course, such a model must be fault tolerant because there are, as we, seen, as we have seen, there are sometimes um, issues with measurement accuracies. Occasionally, there may have been packaging errors and other things, so we, we need a model which can, can cope with that. And, well, we ended up with this Beijing graphical model, which I will describe in detail in the following. Okay, so let's start with the parcels. We have, for every parcel, the weight, D, and the volume, V. And in total, we have M parcels observed, and this is indicated by the plate, as usual for graphical models, is a plate with the index J running <coughs> from 1 to M. So what does it look like? Here we see a scatter plot of some of the parcels with a, with a volume scattered over the weight. And we, we can make out some, well, nice clusters. Um, but it is actually much more interesting to look at the unloaded weight of the parcels. And we can achieve that. For, for, <clears throat> for the uh, data which is shown here, I cho I've chosen only those parcels where all articles inside have been manually weighed before. So this manual measurements of the article weights allow us to subtract the net weight from the gross parcel weight, and we end up with a tear or unloaded weight of the parcels. And now we see, we see some distinct clusters, which cl cluster very well in the volume, which cluster not so good in, in the weight, so there the overlaps are much larger. But it is now quite interesting to compare that with the nominal measurements of the different parcel types we use. And there we see those clusters match quite well. Um, not surprisingly, the cluster which uh, belongs to, to the shipping bags fluctuates much more in volume than the parcel, uh, the parcel clusters, which is clear because the, shipping, the volume of the shipping bags is mainly determined by their contents, where, while the volume of the parcel boxes is more or less fixed. Very well. But then something, something weird is happening here, because there are like almost 5% of parcels where the unloaded weight is negative. That means these would be parcels where the content would be heavier than the parcel itself. That's pretty strange. And that is mainly due to, to the measurement fluctuations and, and um, errors in, in the article weighing process. So this actually was a point where we started, mm, where we started to think, oh, with a manual weighing process, there might be something wrong. I will show you later how this is resolved with, with the new um, Bayesian uh, article measurements. OK, but for now, we, we have our parcels, and we model the weight of the parcel 
by with a weight of the items which are in the parcel, and we assume here that in the J's parcel there are LJ items inside, and all these items have a weight giving rise to a random variable XLJ. And then the weight of the articles plus some noise, which models uh, the tear weight of the parcel, gives us um, a, a generative model for the parcel weight. And we have seen that we have several clusters, and therefore we model this with a mixture of Gaussians. And <coughs> So we have, we have k um, different clusters. Each cluster has its own mean and variance, and altogether gives a mixture, a coupled mixture of Gaussians for the parcel weight and volume. OK, with that, we have the parcel model more or less complete. And while the manual measurements are, will have their difficulties, they are quite OK to initialize that mixture of Gaussians. So we train, we initially train that mixture of Gaussians just with this data where we have manual measurements for every parcel. Later, later on, this will be refined. OK, now let's come to, to the article part of the model. So we, have, we, want, to have, uh, we want to know the weight of an SKU I. This is denoted by, the, by a random variable xi. And it could be, for example, this shoe in a particular size. And for this shoe, it happened that we have several manual measurements which had been carried out independently over some period of time. And what we can see here is that these measurements fluctuate considerably. Um, and this is, as I already mentioned, mainly due to different filling and stuffing material the suppliers use. And remember, we always want to estimate the weight of that, of that article with all packaging that belongs to it. And also it happens that the suppliers sometimes change the shoe boxes, which could here give rise to, to distinct clusters in, in the model. So, at least um, we, have to have to, we have to find some distribution which models these fluctuations well. And well, in order to have the model more or less tractable, we used um, a Gaussian distribution to model this. With a slightly different, we, we don't use the, the standard parameterization of the Gaussian with mean and variance, but instead we use a mean and a relative precision. And the relative precision allows us to, to model the standard deviation or variance of that Gaussian distribution proportional to the mean. That is, a constant relative precision would scale the standard deviation linearly with the mean. And of course, now we have n of these articles, and this is again indicated by the plate with the index running from 1 to n. And each of its article weight distribution has its own parameters, mi and rho i. And all these parameters, for these parameters, again, we have prior distributions. It is, well, somehow exotic, a gamma prior for mi and the inverse gamma prior for rho i, and all these priors share the same hyperparameters. I can show you how these priors look more, more or less. So the gamma distribution for the mean gives rise to reasonable weight averages up to like two and a half kilogram, and the inverse, prior, inverse gamma prior for rho i gives rise to reasonable relative standard deviations up to like 15 or 20 percent of the mean. And this limit of standard deviation at the same time limits the support of, of negative values, which are part of the Gaussian distribution, but which don't make sense in, in our model. Well, 
so we have the parcel model, and at the same time, we have the article model, and now we, we need to combine them, and we combine them in the straightforward manner that we say the weight of the articles in the parcel comes from the di distribution of the corresponding stock-keeping unit. And with that, we have the model complete. The model constitutes of known values. Usually, they are indicated by, by shaded nodes. These, are values, these values are measured. We have, we, have, um, we have latent variables, which are random variables, which are not known, but which are inferred from the observed data. These are the unshaded nodes. And we have hyperparameters for the Gaussian mixture model and for the prior distributions for, for the mean and the relative precision of the article weights. And now, in this model, this model isn't analytically tractable, so we have to solve this with an approximation. And the approximation is Gibbs sampling over the latent random variables. So we do a Gibbs sampling over the cluster assignments, over the weight of every individual article which was in the parcel, and we do Gibbs sampling over the parameters of the article normal distributions, mi and rho i. And then, <coughs> in every, then we sample conditionally the weights of the of the article Xi of the whole SKU. And from these, sam from these samples, which don't follow any, any tractable distribution anymore, we compute sample quantiles. And these sample quantiles are stored in a database and are used for, for further, uh, for f are used as a main outcome of, of this model. And then we have the hyperparameters, and these hyperparameters need to be optimized somehow. And we use here um, an expectation maximization algorithm. And in every iteration, we, we do an M-step update of, of these parameters. We do that by computing um, the, <coughs> the log likelihood of, of our observed data given these parameters and do an online gradient ascent up, uh, online gradient ascent step update step okay so to have a closer look what do we have actually here we have we want to know a distribution of our sku wide xi given all parcels whoops sorry given all parcels and all hyperparameters. Hyperparameters here I uh, put together into the variable theta. And that is in the Gibbs sampling procedure like a mixture of distributions. And remember, this distribution was a normal distribution with different parameters, m i and rho i. And we sample t of these, of these parameters using Gibbs sampling. And the Gibbs samples themselves come from this distribution. That is a that is a posterior distribution. Oops, I, that is a posterior distribution of all our latent variables, given our observed data and the theta. Um, <clears throat> well, and a nice thing here, and it's actually the, the part which makes this scalable to, to millions of, of data points, is that the Gibbs sampling distributions are conditionally independent. And that means that in every iteration, we can sample one after another the individual weights of every of these m parcels in parallel, given, given um, the, the observed uh, parcel, parcel weight and, and cluster uh, assignments and the distribution parameters. Then we can sample in parallel the 
values of mi and rho i, given the weights of the individual parcel items. And similarly, when we can cluster in parallel, uh, we can sample in parallel the cluster assignments. And last but not least, we can sample in parallel, we can perform the conditional sampling in parallel. So, and this is done in parallel in every iteration and allows to scale that to pretty large sizes. Well, let's come to, to some data, some experiments. We have a steadily increasing data set um, of, of parcels and articles. It is like several 10,000 new parcels every day. And as I mentioned, at the moment, we have in, in, in the order of, of million articles, where quite a, quite a bit of them are out of stock already. We have like tens of millions of parcels and, and hundreds of millions of articles. You see here an histogram how, how these items distribute over, over the parcels. That is, we have, um, we have something like, like a power law um, in, uh, describing the number of items per parcel on the left. So most of, most of the parcels contain only one item, a good part two and three and, and, and four, and it has uh, quite a long tail. On the other hand, interesting number is how, how often this item was shipped already, or an item was shipped already. And this distribution has a very, very long tail. So there are quite a large number of items which have, which have shipped on a couple of times before only, but more items which in, in the tail which are shipped many, many times. So the top sellers would be on the very right of this distribution, which is truncated here at, at 50. Well, we run this on, on, a, on a Slurm cluster, which um, is uh, quite big and suitable for this problem. It has two nodes, uh, 32 cores, and uh, 200, uh, 320 gigs of RAM per node. Pretty nice. We have a, a, a net app storage where we, where we store our data, input and output data. And currently, we run 20,000 iterations. Um, where we use 1,000 burn-in burn iterations, which are necessary in order to first train or, or, or saturate the training of the hyperparameters. And then a GIP sampling usually needs some time, some samples to, to come to a steady state. Well, so here I show you some results of, of the weight estimation. We have um, here, for example, 10,000 items. And as I said, for, for every item, we estimate a distribution in terms of quantiles. And what I did here is I used, I used um, the difference between the 95 and 5% 5 quantile and scaled that by the median. So that we have, like, the median of our distribution is normalized to 1. And we have different widths of the distribution, if you want. And now I sorted these data by the width of this 90% confidence interval, if you want. And this gives us the, this trumpet plot. So we see that the upper green line would be the upper, so or the 95% quantile, and the lower green line would be the 5% quantile of the estimated weight distribution. And then we have measured weights for all these data in, in this example here, so we can compare the estimated weights with the measured weights. And we see, yeah, they fall nicely into that trumpet, but then they are there are quite a few outliers here. And theoretically, this should be 5% outliers, since it is 5% quantile above and 5% below. But it's a bit more. And so the question was, is that a matter of, is that a fault of our estimation, or is it a fault of the measured weights? And now remember, we had uh, the scatter plot, and we had parcels where, like, 
the items inside were heavier than the parcel itself. And now I looked at items which contributed, uh, I, I looked at SKUs which contributed to those parcels only. And I marked them in this figure with a red circle. And as you can see, all these SKUs which gave rise to negative unloaded parcel rates, you, you see, you find them above the trumpet. So this is an indication that, in fact, with a measurement, with the manual me measurement process, is something wrong, and the, the estimated rates by by this method are much more precise. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is not not a similar approach for 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 the lower outliers because it's it's not so easy to draw a hard line here which items were too heavy, actually. OK. So here, you can see a plot where we, where we investigated the accuracy of our method depending on, on the number of times this item was shipped before. And we see on the y-axis the width of the 90% uh, confidence interval um, relative to, to its median. So we see for, for items which have been shipped a few times before, this interval is quite large. So there, the measurement error is high, and this is, or the estimation error is high, and this is what we actually would expect because, well, the, the, the more often we, we ship out an item, the more precise the estimate can be. <clears throat> and, well, here we can say up for items which have been shipped like 10 times or less, our method certainly has a certain cold start problem. <clears throat> but now it's interesting to compare the, the plot I showed you before with a net parcel rate when we, estim when we don't use the manual measurements, but we use the measurements, uh, we use the estimates of rates coming from, from, our, from our Bayesian model. And there we see, well, now the clusters fluctuate in white much less, and we see in still a nice alignment to, to the nominal rates of, of the net parcel, uh, of the tear parcel rates, except here where all are a bit, bit heavier, which may be that, I don't know, it, it may be that the nominal weight is wrong, or maybe we have, we have a bias there, it's not quite clear. Um, <clears throat> Still, we see that um, the, the volume, of course, for the shipping bags clusters much more. And we also see that barely no items give rise, or no estimates give rise to, to negative parcel rates. Well, and that's already almost the end of my, of my talk. Um, to conclude, we showed that a large-scale Bayesian estimation uh, of these retail article rates as well possible. So we could address the problem of that very ill post set of equations with a more sophisticated analysis. This process is um, running in a, in a live productive state 24-7. We currently, we update the rates every week um, on that slum cluster. And as I showed you, that this model may have a cold start problem, but it continuously increases with, with the number of shipped out parcels. Um, for the cold start problem, it isn't, it isn't, uh, too, isn't well applicable for items which have never been shipped out before. Therefore, there are still some um, manual measurements, and in, in the back end, there are some heuristic used for like um, exotic items which are barely shipped. They use manual measurements rather, and for, for top sellers, they use our estimates, which are much more reliable than. For future work, we, we could think of, of a remedy of that cold start problem. For example, we could introduce um, 
features which describe the articles into the article features. We could think of, for example, something that when we, when we look at the scale of sizes of articles, then the smaller sizes could be expected to be lighter, and the larger sizes would be expected to be heavier, things like that. And of course, we 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 working on um, working on to make use the the manual weight measurements in a probabilistic way. So the the manual measurements have large fluctuations and large errors, but they still provide information about the article weights. And of course, we we should make use of that, and that will be part of future research. Yeah, and that's the end of my talk. And I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> um, we have a few minutes. We have some time left. If there's any, any, <laughs> any, any person who wants to do any any questions? No. So thank you again, Roland and Tom. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Okay. First of all, congratulate you for making accessible such a terse uh, topic, such as weighting uh, parcels with mm. Bayesian approach. And uh, um, one of the possible problems was the, 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 the cases where you have very few, um, uh, mm -hmm. very few uh, items, and particularly with great dispersions. Did you? Um, try with some other distributions instead of uh, Gaussians or like uh, I don't know a Poisson or, or 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 did you did you investigate with different distributions with the, uh, um, instead of just varying the parameters of the Gaussian and, yeah. and, the, and, and the effect it had? Yeah. So we we, we tried different distributions. Um, if I understand you right, you you asking for. You're asking for this distribution? Yeah. It is, in, in, in fact, it looks here that a Gaussian is maybe not the, the, the best solution here. Um, at first glance, one could think of maybe two Gaussians would be fit much better here. And this would give rise to, to um, a mixture model here for this article where we don't have, um, where we don't know how many components there are because there are quite a lot of articles where this is exactly one peak and one cluster. In principle, it would work out with a probabilistic Gaussian mixture here quite in a straightforward way. One would also gip sample the number, one would, one would introduce another random variable, which would be the number of clusters of the Gaussian mixture, and one would do gip sampling for the cluster assignments quite like as with the parcels. But this would introduced quite a lot of computational complexity here. And therefore, we decided to go with, with this distribution. On the other hand, one could think of, distribution here, of distributions here which exclusively, exclusively limit, are limited to positive support, because negative values don't make sense here at, at all. These turn out to be um, not as well applicable because a nice property of the model we have right now is that these distributions are almost analytically feasible. So three of them you can sample analytically. And for, let me see, I, I, I don't know, I don't remember. I think for, for, for this one, we need to do slice sampling. So this is pretty fine. If we would have, uh, not a Gaussian distribution, but some different. It is in, we we, we uh, give up the, the conjugate relationship between the prior and and the random variables, and this would give rise to much more complicated sampling procedures, and again to more computational complexity. So it's a trade-off, actually. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions? Yep. So thank you ever, ever so much again, Roland. Thank you. Thank you.